Yesterday, for those of you that were at our AGM, uh, we talked about the incredible uh, work of uh, Community Shares and the work Cooperatives UK does uh, within uh, cooperative communities. Um, and as we know, we've heard it from our mayors, we've heard it from the leader uh, of, of finance member at Birmingham City Council yesterday, but cooperatives really are at the heart of communities and do produce solutions but there's also lots of challenges again it's a theme that's come out that it, it's not easy uh, to work in uh, you know communities when you've got volunteers who are time poor or you've got real significant challenges and you've not got big funding to be able to deliver them so we're hoping today to hear from some people uh, about what that support and what those solutions are. Um, and as well, something I'm really uh, pleased to see, we've got Sarah Barlow with us, who's one of the um, Voice of the Postmasters uh, campaign group. And again, you heard me talk yesterday about how cooperatives could be offering solutions to people who are facing significant challenges. So I think it's going to be a great session. Delighted that uh, Tom McNeil is going to be hosting for us. And joining us, we've got Sarah Barlow, Voice of the Postmaster, Christopher Oliver, from the Ubelli Initiative, we've got Isla McCulloch from Cooperatives UK and Natasha Natarajan from Outlandish Cooperative. Over to you, Tom. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I really am very grateful to be here because I know on a panel like this, we've got a really diverse range of contributions here and I know I'm going to leave with some extra nuances that I didn't have before. And looking at the last panel that was on, I know there's going to be overlap but I do think that what we've got on this panel is a diversity of experiences and perspectives. Now, I think with the title of this, you know, Cooperatives at the Heart of Communities, what this panel's going to emphasise is what I know lots of people in this room know already, but when we talk about cooperatives, sometimes we're talking about the core corporate structures of cooperatives, whether it's big corporate or smaller social enterprise size, but we're also talking about collaborative cultures but also empowerment of communities. Now in this panel, some, I think, are gonna be talking a little bit more about the local social enterprise structures of cooperatives and the, the economic and the ownership components. But some of our speakers are gonna talk about how to get a collective voice to speak up against power and where the commonalities with cooperation are with that, but also what might cooperative principles do to elevate that. Now to set the scene, what I'm going to do is just throw in a bit of polite challenge towards government power. And I think it's really relevant for the different kinds of cooperative just touched upon there. It's relevant for what responsibilities do they take to convene partners to enable cooperative social enterprises, large or small, volunteering or otherwise. But also, what do they do not to repeat some of the same mistakes of public institutions of defensiveness, and creating the conditions of closed walls and doors whereby we have to have communities grouped together to shout up for underrepresented voices. And I'll just briefly say why I come to this view, and then I'm going to go to the most important people, which is the, the panel here. For, from my previous experience, I was Assistant Police and Crime Commissioner for the West Midlands, and we had some core power, we had some money, we had some legal duties, but by far the most powerful stuff I saw was when we used the platform to convene people to make things happen that wouldn't have happened had we not brought them together. Talking about school exclusions, we came to the realisation as a real consensus around the partnerships needed for the holistic sport support that would prevent exclusions from happening. And that work wasn't happening yet. And likewise with things like gambling addiction, there was some core statutory services who didn't really know it was a problem. There was some third sector organisations over here doing brilliant work, but no one ever referring to them. And just by using your convening power, you made things happen and people started to access help. But through those benefits, what I also saw was where public bodies, including in the West Midlands, were not convening partners in the way that they should. So when we talk about Birmingham City Council, of which I've got a lot of respect for certain politicians and officers, but I think they could be doing more to convene people who want to set up cooperatives who are already operating that space to talk about these urgent asset disposals. How are we going to prevent a mass transfer of assets and capital to private wealth 
rather than have a conversation early where people really know about how to deliver alternative models. If we don't convene people and you don't use your power, missed opportunity. And likewise, with the West Midlands Mayor, it's very good to come here and talk about believing in cooperatives, and I believe Richard Parker does, but with community energy, the opportunities are so exciting, he needs to step in and use his power to convene people now across the region to talk about how we're going to make this happen then. And I'm going to use my power to bring the partners together. And I think that's going to really feed into some of these conversations. How do we elevate what they're already doing or what they want to do by making sure those leaders are opening the conversation and not closing it down with defensiveness? Now, because people's experiences are so different, I'm not going to open up with particularly prescriptive questions here because I want people to have their own voice and say what they want to say. So we're just going to go around the panellists in turn just to tell us who you are, what you're doing, and with the title here, what do you, what do you want to say first, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. It could go in all sorts of directions. So on the list that I had to go first, Christopher, I'm going to hand over to you. Cool. Uh, good morning. And um, yeah, so my name's Christopher Oliver. Um, and I'm the policy and research officer at the Ubele Initiative. And the Ubele Initiative is an uh, African diaspora-led infrastructure organization. And I want to introduce the work of Ubele um, at the intersection of the cooperative movement. Because I think although the Ubele Initiative is not a cooperative, um, we connect with the cooperative movement in quite interesting ways. And I think, so our headquarters is at the Wolves Lane Centre uh, in Wood Green, and we, which is like a three-acre site, um, which we have a 25-year lease on. Um, and it's, so we're part of a consortium with Organic Lee, which is a worker cooperative. Um, and we've recently completed three buildings on the site, which we'll be moving into um, next month. Um, and there's a sociocratic uh, model of, of governance for the consortium. Um, and, and in addition, uh, the Ubele Initiative is incubating an, a housing cooperative called Gida Housing Cooperative, um, which is based at the old St. Anne's Hospital site in South Tottenham. So we've secured 56 housing units um, and we're supporting the incubation of a housing cooperative alongside the Filipino community uh, and road housing cooperative. Um, and again, another sort of connection to the cooperative movement is the experiences of you know, some of the team members. Um, one of our directors, Michael Hamilton, he um, was part of a cooperative in South London um, called Fug Fusions Jameen Cooperative, which was a, a group of um, predominantly African-Caribbean people um, who came together to, for a self-build project and built, I think, over 10 homes um, and so there's these interesting connections between uh, the Ubele initiative and the, the cooperative movement um, so yeah nice to be here thank you very much that was great uh, Natasha hi everyone um, I'm here from Outlandish Cooperative we're a worker cooperative in North London in Finsbury Park and our commercial business is to deliver like digital tools, websites, data-driven campaigns, things like that for progressive organizations. So it might be trade unions, public sector, campaign groups. Um, but we invest our profits back into social projects. And one of those social projects is called Space4, which is why I'm here. Um, because we're a workspace in Finsbury Park and it's where Outlandish has their offices but it's also a, co a kind of co-working space. And just speaking to what you were saying, Tom, I think it's really a convening space um, between kind of government and local economy because we, the reason we're there is because we've developed a strong relationship with Islington Council who really support co-ops, um, are really into their community wealth building strategy and really want to grow the cooperative movement in the borough. 
Um, and so we're one of their affordable workspaces. And so we have multiple hats on. Uh, in the sense that we are trying to deliver social value to the borough, trying to you know, help people um, get into employment, we're trying to build the cooperative movement, um, but we're also you know, part of this larger co-op, um, we're, we're part of this movement and trying to serve the sort of political needs, um, trying to spread political education about democratic business. Uh, and it's been interesting talking to people um, yesterday about, you know, the need for, yeah, like, you know, yesterday the cooperative party was talking about doubling, the, doubling cooperatives in the UK and sitting in space four, sometimes it's hard to talk about co-ops and what it really means to start a co-op. And I think before we even start to talk about, like, how to start a co-op, we need to talk about what does it mean for freelancers to collaborate? Um, what does it mean to actually want to work with other people? Because the spirit of like entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism and like being your own boss has sort of infiltrated every part of work, I think. So what am I trying to say? There's so many hats on. Um, Co-ops in the heart of community. Yeah, I suppose, you know, we're a workspace. We're, we're helping people with affordable workspace because we work with council, but we're also trying to like, embody the spirit of cooperation with co-ops, but also with the general public. Um, yeah, and it's worth mentioning maybe that we, we started the space uh, because we co-founded Cotech, um, which is a UK-wide network of tech cooperatives. And the reason that we wanted to have a space is because we realized that there aren't that many physical spaces for the co-op movement to convene. Um, so speaking again of that, com that importance of convening you know, the different parts of our movement and the different sort of cooperative elements of society in kind of neutral spaces, I suppose. And I think what sounds really interesting from that is you're talking about an example where a local authority, where a power base has opened up the conversation and then things have happened as a result of that kind of collaborative two-way discourse. And Sarah? So uh, I have probably two hats on for um, community. The first is I'm a postmaster and I wasn't involved in the historic shortfalls. Um, I bought my branch about six years ago and uh, obviously shortly after the pandemic happened. So from a community perspective, we were classed as key workers. And we formed in my branch a, a community hub where we had 85 volunteers helping over 300 people a day with shopping, with prescriptions, with just phone calls, just having that interaction. So the importance of community from my post office and many across the country became a totally different challenge. We were trusted um, as, as a network and regardless of what the brand is going through at the moment, the brand is the postmasters. The postmasters are the face that people see every day. And that's probably what has kept us riding this horrific storm that we're in the middle of. My second community hat was, um, and is as part of the voice of the postmaster. We are, um, we were a very small group of postmasters who were becoming increasingly concerned with the way we were being treated by not only our um, main shareholder, the government and post office itself, because we're all independents, we, we all own our own branches, and things were becoming um, more and more complicated and more difficult to run a business. Um, a few of us got together on a forum and chatted, and we grew, and we now have over a thousand members. And we were seen as a, um, a protest group because we were a little bit naughty at the, be at the beginning. We, we had to get attention by you know, all emailing the CEO at the same time on the same day and things like that. Um, we, we were a little bit naughty. Um, but now we ha we've, we've kind of bridged that gap and we are obviously trying to steer through this, um, this ship that has been the um, Horizon scandal, um, which has now become a national tragedy, really, with the, with the amount of people that have been affected by it, not only the 555 who um, were prosecuted and, and had to pay lots of money back, but um, there's still postmasters within the network still suffering who just paid the money back, but were impacted differently. Um, as our group has grown as a community of postmasters, we, we had one direction, and that was to be treated more like a partner 
within the organisation. Um, that's grown legs and we have different hats and we are now you know, a, a totally different community. Um, and we have a seat at the table now where we, we meet with the post office, we meet with um, various cross-party MPs on a regular basis. Um, you know, Labour um, has, has mentioned um, what's there in hopes of, to be with the post office in their manifest. Um, and that was down to a Voice of the Postmaster meeting that we had with some MPs a couple of weeks ago um, in London. So we've, we've, we've grown up as a group. Um, we've grown up and we are, we're currently working on a wellbeing initiative um, that will be rolled out throughout the country for all postmasters because there's absolutely no support. Even now, we're still using the horizon. We're currently paying for the new MBIT system that's coming through and we're currently paying for, rightly so, for the people who've been affected historically. So there's lots and lots of work to do. Um, it was really interesting to sit in the back of the room um, this morning and watch such a positive organisation and, and such a happy place to be in. And whereas I sit in a, a much darker space, um, things are getting better. Things, um, obviously, when the ICV drama come out, we're in a really, really sad state of affairs. But the strength that we had within our communities, um, that's what got us through. Our customers were coming in. We didn't know you were going through this. We didn't know this was happening to you, offering the support. And, um, and there's a lot of strength in empathy. There's, um, and, I, and I say this whenever I meet any of the, the general exec, don't underestimate the power of people. Um, and we only have to look today at Alan Bates, who is now Sir Alan, and, and rightly so. Um, it's a 20 year battle. My battle currently is two years old, and but thanks to the work that Alan's put in and um, all his colleagues, we're moving forward a lot quicker um, and hopefully we'll see light at the end of the tunnel. We've got our conference on Tuesday um, and it'll be really interesting to see because I'd like to think that we've come a long way um, as a group and obviously the next government coming in, things are going to change. Things are going to change with the end of the inquiry. Things are going to change with um, prosecutions that could or, or may or may not happen. So we've got um, a very kind of unshaky path um, to go through. But the, the strength comes from the community we have in our branches and the community we have in each other. So. Um, maybe a cooperative is the answer, maybe a mutualisation is the answer, it, but it's very complex because the post office as a network is very complex. But that's not to say we can't form some kind of strategy going forward to make the postmasters have a profitable organisation. We have this immense social value that is vastly underpaid. Um, and, and there's answers, we've got answers as a group. We don't go, give us more money. We go, we go in and go, this is where we think you can find some money. This is where you think this should be distributed. This is where you think it should be cut. So um, that, that's where we're at, at our level. No, well, f thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the path is quite tender core because I was going to invite people to say thank you very much for your contribution to it. So that's great. And that clearly that's what everybody feels. Um, and I think what's really interesting about that is obviously so much of the conversation in, at cooperative conferences is about talking about collaboration and diplomacy. But obviously in the real world sometimes, first, to get to this place that you've got to, you need real challenge as well. And sometimes it's about really holding people to account. Isla? Yeah, how do I follow that? So, uh, I think your point about being here and it being a happy place was really interesting to me because I do feel this immense privilege to work for Cooperatives UK and work in the community shares movement where every day I hear and work with inspiring communities who are taking matters into their own hands. But you're absolutely right. Almost every single one of them has emerged from a crisis of some situation, whether that's a housing crisis, the last fuel station is closing for 50 miles, our leisure centre is about to be closed down, Every community share offer I've worked with and seen has emerged from a disaster of some description, not at a national scale, more at a local scale, and the communities have gone, 
this is it's either a failure of the market or a failure of the state, depending on how you see things, and how can we as communities set up cooperative models to actually address it. And where it works best, and where I've seen it work best, is in partnership with local authorities, cross-political parties, being apolitical and coming together and working together. So, yeah, really privileged to work in this role and really interesting moment because we've seen a lot of communities, I'm talking from the perspective of community share offers, community benefit societies, set up to address what I think of as market failure, like the last pub closing, the shop closing, the post office is closing locally, um, and things like that. But more and more we're seeing these communities step into that breach of where is local government failing or where are budget cuts creating these crises of essential services being cut back. And it's not just communities versus the state, it's actually how do we work together to deliver these services, maybe in a better way in the long term as well. So that's kind of where I'm at with trying to explore what, what are, are, what's our role as Co-ops UK in convening that potentially and illustrating and sharing good practice and different models and different ways to address them. No, thank you for that. So what, what I'd like to do with the, this next set of questions, and I know there's huge expertise in the room, so the print, the technical principles people will be really, really on top of. But what I think would be really helpful is, and we'll go in reverse order to, to go through these specific examples, is to explain with reference to your examples what would be the difference if it wasn't there? If what you've seen and what you've contributed to putting in place, if that wasn't there, what would be the situation? And what have you created through your kind of cooperative work or your kind of collective voice? And then also, in that answer, just give us a hint about what were the first couple of steps taken to get where you are. And, and again, I know there's great expertise in this room, but what I think is really valuable when we're talking in other communities is to really spell out why is this a great thing and what would the alternative have been? And then, for people who feel inspired by that, in whatever their context, what are the first couple of things they would do to, to realise something similar in their own context? So we'll, we'll start with you. Um. So I could, obviously, it's, it's a funny place because I've worked with a lot of organizations, but I guess I could go back to some of the organizations I've worked with closely local to home. So I live in Oban on the west coast of Scotland, and I grew up in Edinburgh. So my first experience with this was in Edinburgh, was around we set up a community greengrocer shop because there was an absolute dearth of independent shops. It was about supporting the high street. And, and providing routes to market for healthier food. And that was a public meeting and people being really angry <laughs> about what was happening to the high street with retailers being locked out. So the public meeting was the first step, was is there a collective of people who really care, who really want to see change and make a difference and have a positive, well, initially just being like, ah, <laughs> what do we do? So I think having that collective moment of like, let's acknowledge this, this is a bad situation, whatever it is. And then how can we address it? Um, really, and even where I am now in Oban, there's been a lot of that. There's been huge cutbacks over the years. But now we have a community-owned leisure centre that's going 25 years in partnership with a local authority. And it's better than any local authority-run leisure centre I go to in the country because it's community-owned and run. But it took loads of public meetings and getting people together and knocking our heads together and saying, how can we agree on a way forward? And I think I sometimes get a bit of jip from the team because they're like, stop telling people it's so hard <laughs> to start a co-op. But it is, and it, I, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of community cooperatives where you're trying to be representative. We have huge local authorities where people don't feel represented. We're saying we're creating a democratic structure where you can feel represented at a local level. That's a challenge. There's a challenge to people's culture, to people's sense of self, sense of identity as well. Um, yeah, so I think the main thing is bringing the people together in the first instance to actually acknowledge the challenge you're facing, as Sarah said in that specific campaign is really relevant. But across the board from like the work we've done together as well, it's, it's so critical for me in terms of next steps. And I've seen people try to start community share offers and raise capital for solutions and they've not articulated the problem they're trying to solve to start with um, and they flopped they don't succeed they just don't work out and I hate the idea of people putting loads of time into something that's not going to work but 
for it to work, you have to put that time in really early on to work together. Okay, Sarah. So from a, a really um, beginning, small perspective, I have, um, my, in my branch, um, there's probably nothing I don't know that goes on in my community because everybody comes in and tells me. Everybody, I know who's having what knee replacement to what the parish council are up to. We know everything and we're trusted. And one voice obviously can make a difference. But when you put multiple voices together, it adds strength. So whereas I might have somebody coming in, I had a lady come in and tell me a diagnosis of cancer and she hadn't told her family. And for several weeks she came in saying, I've had this done, I'm having that done, and I kept pushing for it, tell your family, tell your family. It made a difference that she had come and talk to us. It made a difference that she had come and talk to me and any of my staff. And eventually, because collectively as, as a group of workers, we, we got her to, to open up to her family and she got, and she got the support we need. And that was a tiny, tiny little win for us. Where the voice of the postmaster is concerned, it was feeling my own vulnerability. It was dreading that cash declaration button each night. It was looking at the pay remuneration each month going, how am I going to make this stretch? And then finding other voices who were feeling the same. The fact that I, could, I, I spoke out to a couple of people and we grew and we grew and we become a huge, powerful collective where our opinion matters. So whereas my little tiny voice of, oh, I don't want to do this, it was the, the problems with the historic aspect was everyone thought they were alone. Everybody thought it was just them. Whereas now us as a collective, it's never just us. And, and the beauty of a cooperative is that there's a huge strength in one powerful voice, but there's absolutely immeasurable when you've got a collective that's really, I think, really powerful. So if we do another question, just to quickly follow up, if we've got another injustice, you know, coming up somewhere, which there will be, because we live in a complex society and injustices are there, and somebody feels that they've been incredibly wronged, whether it's by a public body or a corporation or whatever, what would you say, what, what's the first thing they need to do to, to try and identify if there's other experiences? Well, thankfully, similar? because there's been... There's, there's been, uh, obviously, we've got Hillsborough, we've got Grenfell, we've got a lot going on. And um, in, the, in the Labour manifesto, they've, um, they're going to push for the Hillsborough law. I'm a Hillsborough family member, just for transparency. Um, and I'd like to think that the legacy of what we've been through is that this won't happen again. Obviously, it's happened with the post office. Obviously, it's, there's plenty of examples of where it's happening. With the Hillsborough law, hopefully, it won't happen again. Hopefully, people will see what's gone before them and have the strength to speak out quickly and be listened to rather than pushed away. And just before we come to Natasha, just for anybody who doesn't know, if you just spell out what, what the Hillsborough law is doing, what, what is it doing? So, with the Hillsborough law will, um, obviously, with Hillsborough, you were... You were you were facing the government. Um, the, it's the same with um, the Horizon scandal. That obviously, you're you're fighting the powers that be, um, and a little voice again. Um, it takes a long time to become a big voice. It's taken over 20 years for um, the Horizon people. It's taken, uh, oh God, I mean, we we on 35 years for Hillsborough, but the Hillsborough law will put an end to that. The Hillsborough law will allow people who've been victims of national scandals and national uh, fighting the government or whatever to um, be listened to and have the strength and the backing to fight anything. So whereas, you know, a lot of these scandals, there's, there's no money, there's no one to fight. Whereas, you know, there's whoever you're challenging has got power, has got legal representation, they're going to get the legal representation. So it's quite complicated, it's quite complex, yeah. but it's a support network that's in place. No, that, that was brilliantly explained. Natasha. Um, yeah, so I think I mentioned that Space 4, the workspace that we run, um, was born out of a need to have a, a physical space where the cooperative community could come together. And I think it's been really important to have that physical space. Um, it's kind of like a shop front. It's like a place where you can just come and if you're interested in co-ops and talk to real people who are in co-ops or interested in co-ops. 
And so for me personally, that's kind of how I came into the co-op movement, which is only two and a half years ago now. Um, but I was writing my dissertation on freelancer politics and um, I found some research about co-ops and I literally searched London co-ops on Google and arrived at a space which really embodied cooperative values. Um, you know, you can feel from the space, I think, that this is more than just, it's not, it's definitely not a we work, you know, or it's not one of your corporate workspaces. It, it really has cooperative values and there's a lot of community work that goes on in the space um, beyond just work. It's about kind of life and I think that's come up in some of the other panels, you know, being in a co-op is, a, is goes beyond work life, it's, it's life itself. Um, but we also, you know, we nurture young businesses because we've partnered with the council. We're really an affordable space. We offer payment in kind and sliding payment scales, which means we get a lot of different types of people in the space and we're able to help them grow their businesses, their ideas, um, and inspire them with the values of cooperativism in a, in a like embodied way. I don't know really how to explain it in a cultural way, um, which I don't think you could achieve if you know you just ask for a call with someone who's in a co-op on zoom it's not quite the yeah. same um, i know it's you... really hard because what you're describing is a, is a whole system and there's clearly so many things going on it's actually quite hard to pluck out yeah. specifics it's, it's bigger than that and it takes more than a quick sentence but there's one more thing actually yeah, go I, for add, it. Um, I think also the the relationship that we've nurtured with islington council is very unique and we're lucky that they're you know a really progressive minded council lots of progressive councillors and are really invested in their community wealth building agenda and supporting co-ops um, but i think we are an important case study for how you can develop a, a long relationship um, build trust with a, a council team so that even when they don't have money, there's still ambition to, to work together to support the cooperative economy. And, and when there is money, there's you know, a good chance that you know, we, can, we can bid for it. And that's something that I think um, Sarah Longlands from Claire's was here yesterday, maybe talking about progressive procurement. I think that's a big opportunity for the co-op movement to, to step in and really try to get into supply chains of big, big or, bigger organizations to support the growth again, to double the size of the co-op movement. And I think we're a good interface, you know, a shop front for talking about these, a good convening space where we can, you know, match make basically the public sector and small businesses, which is such an ambition of a lot of local authorities at the moment, GLA, but you know, also West Midlands, we heard from the ownership hub yesterday. So I think that is a really, it makes me excited about politics personally, that there is this space it's, there's no money in this space, unfortunately, but there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of dedication and a lot of determination. And particularly when we're talking about community shares, it was really inspiring also to hear about Oban and how many community um, co-ops you've got and the potential to, to, you know, the postmasters to be also getting involved in the movement and different community organisations learning about how you can do this. Just before I come to you, Christopher, you've been waiting very patiently, now you've gone to the back of the queue. It, I'm still really keen just to pluck out, it, even if it's just one example, say, with the relationship you've developed with the local authority, where they might not have given money, but they've helped their open-door approaches. Or something. Can you pluck out an example where that relationship made a difference? Don't worry if you can't, and you can always say it um, a bit later. Yeah, I mean... I mean, what's nice, okay, let me just think of an actual example of, okay, like, for, okay, so we're, we're a physical space, and the, the council uses our space for a lot of meetings, for convening people, and I think we've built a lot of relationships with other um, organisations working in the community. We've been introduced, I think someone else was talking about that today, um, to other local um, community groups or... Like, you know, there's, a, there's an organization that works to get um, people into tech, and we're obviously a tech organization, and I think the, the council is instrumental in introdu introducing us to groups like that and making sure that we, you know, host um, lunches in our space, for example, to get people into the space. And they also sort of um, platform us in wherever they go, talking, yeah. to us, to, talking to other people about our space so that we get new kinds mm -hmm. of people into the space. Yeah. Again, it's that thing about convening and like yeah. telling, the, you know, 
really nurturing the local economy. Like, who's in this economy? Like, how do we find them? Yeah. How do we connect people? I think the council has been good at doing that. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Christopher. Yeah, so um, I should have said before that GIDA Housing Cooperative uh, is in partnership with the GLA and who have provided some funding for this sort of incubation process along with the National Lottery. And, and the self-building in South London that I referenced, um, Fusions, Jameen Housing Cooperative, which is, I don't think, no long, it's no longer a housing cooperative, but in the sort of initial sort of uh, emergence of the, the cooperative, it was in collaboration with the local council in Lewisham um, in order to support people off uh, council housing, uh, the council housing list, essentially. Um, so that's interesting. But, um, but yeah, Ubele's work is sort of focused at the sort of intersection of uh, community wealth building and racial justice. And I think that um, my experience, um, I emerged just before joining Ubele, I was sort of involved in exploring um, the problems, um, policy problems associated with the Windrush scandal. Um, and, and that work was sort of traveling across the country to support predominantly African Caribbean communities um, to access sort of legal support. Um, and I think it was interesting in relation to this conversation because I, I, I guess was introduced to a network of um, African Caribbean so sort of community structures, organizations that have been around since the 60s. Um, and particularly in Manchester, um, where there's a sort of West Indian organizations coordinating committee that was set up in the 60s to address sort of racial justice issues. Um, and it was interesting to, um, well, what's interesting about the West Indian organizations coordinating committee is that you know, those Caribbean people that arrived after the Second World War, um, they set up island associations, um, which w carry sort of cooperative principles or democratic principles, one member, one vote. Um, each island association would elect a representative that would then um, be a part of the, you know, coordinating committee. Um, and they would engage with um, sort of organizations, institutions across Manchester to advocate um, for social justice issues. Um, over the years, due to, you know, I guess, certain forms of, yeah, uh, racialization and, and a lack of access to resources, those organizations are struggling. Um, and perhaps, but I see opportunity. I see, I see opportunity through research that I'm doing with ILA and Cooptives UK with John Dawson, where we're exploring, essentially exploring sort of race equity within, um, you know, uh, the cooperative space and, and to what extent, um, I guess we can sort of think about how to increase, you know, the, the representation of black and racially minoritized communities leading community share offers. Currently, um, 98, well, information that uh, I was introduced to um, by Co-op to UK um, states that 98% of society members are white uh, and 92% of uh, community share offers are led by white um, people. Um, so, so we've been thinking about, okay, how do we address that issue? And in order to, I guess, increase the access to some of the, the knowledge around community shares and cooperative models, because I, in relation to that example I gave with the West Indian Organizations Coordination Committee, I really, now that I've built up my knowledge, I, I really think that, for example, a community benefits society model could really support um, what they're doing. Um, and so I think 
yeah, it's, it's, it's been an interesting sort of inquiry into this space at the intersection of yeah, racial justice and community wealth building. Okay, and that brings us nicely on really to kind of the third part of it. You've talked about, all, all of you have talked about some successes and what's in place already. I suppose sticking with you, Christopher, with everything you just said, what, what is it you'd really like to see? So when we talk about community share offers, what kinds of things would you like to see a, community, a successful community share offer happen around? What kind of project, whether it's further housing or whatever else? And what do you need and what, what do the people you're talking about need to make that a reality? I, th I mean, I think we're still at the stage of, um, well, from Ubele perspective, we're concerned with infrastructural support. Um, and infrastructural support that connects to uh, people that are sometimes sort of labeled hard to reach. Um, but perhaps, you know, those communities, um, you know, aren't plugged into the same infrastructure um, system or framework than, than the communities that are, I guess, benefiting from um, the production of knowledge and the, the access to perhaps certain forms of finance, um, which black and racially minoritized communities historically have had less access to, therefore le less sort of resources in order to convene communities um, around a particular legal model. Um, so I think our focus has been on, and this is what the research has sort of started to sort of focus on is, you know, what does culturally appropriate um, infrastructure support look like um, and to what extent can it reduce the barriers and increase the opportunities for um, yeah, black and racialized communities to lead community share offers um, and reap some of the benefits. Just on that, just a quick follow-up then, who, who would you really like to see take some responsibility for trying to put this infrastructure in place? It, might, it might, clearly might not be one body <laughs> or individual, but who, who is it you're looking at when you, when you yeah. want? Yeah, well, I think, there's, I think there's just many different uh, angles to this question because there's obviously the question of the realm of finance. Um, you know, a lot of organisations support... Uh, get access to grants, um, which enables them to then even consider or convene uh, a community to then develop a community share offer. So there's an intersection between different forms of finance, which therefore, you know, you have to speak to funding bodies um, and, and I, get, I mean, get buy-in from different funders alongside perhaps forms of social investment. Um, so, so there's a sort of finance question and then there's, yeah, the leadership and governance question that connects one to, you know, local councils and, and I guess the kind of infrastructural support or the kind of relationships that Natasha was talking about with local councils to create the conditions within which um, you can convene communities, but also, um, I guess, have that uh, local support, whether it's in kind or, or um, certain forms of investment, or, or that, again, enables, produces the conditions for um, cooperative development. I think you said it yourself, but I think some of the stuff Natasha was talking about sounds exactly like the kind of... Yeah community that you know meant in its broader sense kind of infrastructure needed yeah. to make this conversation happen i'm going to change up the order so i'm not just going straight with the same one so i'm going to come to you next sarah so it's i guess it's about where do you see the work you've done to date and work with colleagues going where, do, where would you like it to go or what what changes would you like to see and who should contribute to that um, I, I think from, from the voice of the postmaster, we, um, the end game is to be a, a partnership and to be treated uh, as a partner. Um, we've all invested um, large sums of money to be in the position that we're in. Um, and there's a lot of aspects of the network where 
we're not uh, we're not asked about and, we're, and it's a given when changes happen and other partnerships um, come into the company um, and that's the change we're looking at and that that's happening we have um, we have various groups at the moment we have postmaster engagement groups we have postmaster listening groups we have branch operational change forums we have IT working groups where postmasters are asked and involved in every decision throughout the network we want to take that up to another level we have we now have two non-executive directors on the board and we have a postmaster engagement director um, in the general executive we want to see more of that um, no one's born a postmaster um, with they come with a wealth of backgrounds and experience so we're looking at um, taking back the company the government are happy for us to wipe our own faces and do our own thing um, so we need to go well where do we go do we need the board do we need this general executive do we need this mass of employees when we've got a wealth of postmasters who could do just as good or just as credible or infiltrate them so our end game is to be at every level within the company um, and to make the decisions that directly impact us and our communities. And, and how much do you think that a, a formal cooperative structure might be pivotal to kind of creating, I guess, a sustainable legacy to that kind of working practice? I, I suppose at some level, because we're already a cooperative because we all own our own branches, um, the problem being is that we're governed by a non cooperative source so we need to maybe look at, I mean the, there's obviously lots of talks um, about mutualization and um, it's a very difficult level to reach um, because the network is so complex and so and and it's whether the postmasters want that as well but there's got to be a, a form of mutualization that maybe we can reach in the, in the long run it's we, we're always going to need government funding because there's such a, 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 a service dynamic to us um, we're a business we've got to make profit as well so we, we're always going to need government funding but then how does that work um, I don't have the answer um, but it's something that we're all looking at we're all working towards um, there's lots of complications because of the inquiry and everything else that's coming we, we need to see what um, Sir Justice Wynne um, directs so um, we're probably looking, you know, nothing within five years mm -hmm. because things, things are just too complicated at the moment. But there's definitely, there's definitely a, a pathway to being more cooperative. And, you know, I don't know how many people in here you already know, but you might meet people in here today who might be able to kind of give some new ideas for what that might, might look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think the one thing that we are open for is suggestions. We, you know, um, the, there's people on my committee who have a really strong feeling about mutualisation and, and the path they want to take. There's equally um, members of my committee who are like it's not for us. This is not where we want to be. So looking for some middle ground. Please get in contact with me if you've got some solutions or a, a, a pathway or an idea because we'd love to look at them because clearly things are broken at the moment and we need to fix them. Yeah, and I think that, that comment on middle ground is particularly interesting because when I talk to people I know in my circles about cooperatives, if they're not familiar and I talk about, you know, how well you could have a direct democratic say, they're like, well, to be honest, I'm exhausted, I'm busy, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want that. And I say, okay, well, what about if you just knew that the economic ownership was among your community and that it wasn't being extracted which brings me well onto you Isla because I know we talked about this before and you can talk about whatever example you want but I do think community energy is an example that a lot of people can understand and a lot of members of the public who might not be familiar with cooperatives can get quite excited about because it is so tangible so maybe what what kind of things need to be put in place to make that a reality not just in the West Midlands but I have a particular <laughs> interest in it right now um, I think it was really interesting, Sarah, that you talked about how, as postmasters, you feel like you're already in a cooperative, but you're underneath a company structure, which is an extractive structure. And Christopher's talked about community wealth building. I hear community wealth building every day, policy makers, local authorities, everyone loves community wealth building. I don't hear them being explicit 
that that's because we live in a system of community wealth extraction and the number of corporations and industries that are extracting wealth. This isn't just about building wealth. This is like hanging on to wealth in our communities at the end of the day. So when I talk about co-ops and communities and how we define that, um, energy is a good example, but capitalism, I started saying it's kind of similar to other isms. Like we understand racism, we understand sexism, prioritizing certain races or certain sexes in certain circumstances. And all businesses need capital, need workers, need suppliers, need customers. Those are all of our stakeholders. And the current model prioritizes the providers of capital. And that is how our wealth is extracted from communities. I live in an area surrounded by wind farms, left, right, and center, multi, multi gabillion pounds being, of wealth being extracted, and so little of that going back in, and the highest rates of fuel poverty in our country. It's grossly unfair. Yet I've also worked with community owned turbines, hydro schemes that are generating now millions of pounds back into their communities because that money that was otherwise potentially even going into other states' publicly owned energy companies. Like we, we're funding Chinese public infrastructure through their private ownership of our enormous offshore wind. And then the alternative to that is we've got, I worked with communities who by building two turbines have been able to provide new primary school facilities, invest in the leisure center, get early year support for people. That wealth is recirculating in the community and they're benefiting from it. And the cooperative model then doesn't give primacy to capital over all those other stakeholders. All of us are, all the stakeholders in it together. So it's not about not needing capital, it's just about prioritizing all stakeholders equally, providers of capital being just one of them, <laughs> not the main one. Um, yeah, here, here. <laughs> so just before we come on to Natasha for her remarks, and then I think we're coming towards the end of the session. So with exactly what you've just said, in Birmingham, or somewhere in Sanwell, Wolverhampton, you've said this to an audience of public members, and they're like, yeah, I really, what's not to, dis, you know, not to agree with about this? It's clearly right. How do we empower them next? What do they do next? And who <laughs> should take responsibility for this? And feel free to point towards government officials or whoever. What should happen next? Uh, I, I mean, it's a prime time, isn't it? I think we're looking at a change of central government. I think that potential needs to be grasped. I'm also a great believer in like the first 100 days really matters for evidence. Like in my working life, I've seen community ownership being, what do you do? What's that? To now in Scotland, I'm speaking from my personal experience, the Scottish Land Fund has existed for a long time. We have a lot more community rights. People just know what I mean. They, and as soon as something goes wrong, they're like, ah, surely there's a community ownership solution to this. And that's a culture change that has come from government in a way, you know, like there's been a leadership in government to say community ownership is about redistributing power and wealth and we're behind that and we back that and yes, there's always tensions of centralization, but I think all of us here and you've got like new mayor in Birmingham, there's a lot of big political change, get it on the agenda, it makes such a difference to say this is normal, this approach is just how we can get things done and how we can solve some of the biggest problems facing us. And our elected leaders do have a responsibility to not just support it on the sidelines and go, oh, well, Rishi Sunak's bought a share in his community pub yeah, yeah, in yeah, Yorkshire. Yeah. Right? Exactly. There are people laughing. <laughs> that doesn't mean he believes in redistribution of wealth, evidently. <laughs> so it's like, how do you stand, how do you hold our elected leaders to account and say that this is a really good way of not just community wealth building, but stopping extracting yeah. wealth from communities. And then just to add, because it's the point I made at the beginning, yes, I mean, I desperately want to see a Labour <laughs> government myself. Um, I'm cooperative. Um, but then it comes down to empowering local leaders and local leaders taking responsibility to convene those conversations and make them happen and not be too passive. 
Because if you're passive, things won't actually happen. So Natasha, you've kind of got the final slot here. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> I know you can handle it. I know you can handle it. Um, okay, what do I want to see? Yeah, so I, I do want to see more co-ops. Obviously, I want to see double the, the I want to see the cooperative movement double in size. Um, how are we going to do that? I feel like we need more money, more business in the sector, more money. And again, I go back to that procurement supply chain thing. I would like to see more, more sort of work done in opening up supply chains to democratic business on the one hand. Um, I think that would really help the co-op sector to have more like stable business, basically. Um, and I think we're a good business partner because like local, like public businesses, we want to invest back into the communities that we work in. On the other hand, I also see a problem that, um, you know, this culture thing that you've, you're saying, the culture does not exist to talk to people about converting to a co-op or starting a co-op. It's quite hard to explain mm. what is the attraction of a co-op. So, so I want to see co-ops. Um, in supply chains. For that, we need to scale, scale co-op businesses, or so start and scale, or we need to convert existing businesses to be co-ops. And that's hard, don't want to be negative, but I think, so I want to see more, more resources going towards education around, um, you know, community shares, around co-op business. I want it to be normal to talk about a, what a co-op business is, because I can't even explain to my parents what, what a co-op <laughs> business is. I mean, I joined as a member like two weeks ago or something now, and my dad, who's quite a like socialist person, was like, oh, so you're a capitalist now. And I was like, <laughs> where do I start? Um, so I haven't started actually, and I'm figuring it out. But so yeah, I think that culture change needs to happen. And maybe part of it is like, I don't want to sound negative, but before we even start converting into co-ops, maybe we just need to start introducing democratic business principles um, into existing businesses. Maybe they won't be co-ops immediately, but they'll be more ethical businesses. And, you know, Stir to Action started the Centre for Democratic Business. We've got democratic business summits now every year. So that makes me excited. Okay, it's not a co-op, but it is sort of... There is, I think, increasingly... Um, Increasingly, people are recognizing the capitalism mm. and wanting to make changes. And though we're not going to get to co-op immediately, we are going to get to more ethical investment, more ethical business practice, better employee rights. Um, and I think the co-op sector has a lot to offer in terms of what kind of values we can show other businesses that they can have, even if they're not going to become co-ops yet. A, a splendid okay. way okay. to end the session. <laughs> Should we give everybody a round of applause for their contributions? <laughs>